have a big mouth eagle to shout. Attention, please! You can sit down. Hi, I'm Naisha McCauley, and you're watching AccessTV.org. Okay, and on with the show. Our moderator for this evening is Louise Simmons. Um, she's a professor at the University of Connecticut School of Social Work and is a former Hartford City Councilwoman. So without further ado, Louise. Thank you very much. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's good to see you here. There is interest in some of these very technical issues about charter revision, which is great to see. Um, so the way this evening is going to go, we'll follow your program. Um, we are going to have um, first a presentation uh, by individuals who were involved in um, the Charter Revision Commission. Uh, Ken Green was our chair, our former state rep from Hartford, and attorney Stephen Mednick was the legal advisor. They will go over the um, process and the specifics, and then we will have um, three people on our panel um, discussing the uh, proposed changes. Um, we want to let you know also, it's in the program, that on election day, a week from Tuesday, a week from tomorrow, there is also an election for Board of Education. There are four candidates and four open seats. So basically, there's not a contest, but um, if you care enough to vote about charter revision, you should also cast your ballots for those people that, um, that you want to vote for uh, among the four, or all four, or however uh, you want to vote. Um, so uh, without further ado, let me introduce Kenneth Green, um, who is a lifelong Hartford resident and the uh, former state representative uh, for District 1. And he is going to talk to you about the, an overview and the process of charter revision. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, let me just try to uh, quickly go through uh, what the process was in terms of the Hartford Charter Revision Commission of 2012-2013. Uh, as you uh, can recall, in 2002, we had a charter revision, and I think that's when we went from a, a weak mayor form of government to a strong mayor form of government. And so uh, the voters came out, and uh, we changed uh, quite a bit of the charter, I think, in 20, uh, 2002. There was another charter revision, I believe, in 2009 uh, that uh, met and came up with some conclusions but because of some technicalities in terms of the timing, that uh, those recommendations were never voted on. And so in uh, 2002, I believe, uh, you have to do a charter revision within 10 years. So in 2012, a, a, a charter revision was commissioned uh, of which we had 11 members, and uh, I was elected chair of that commission. We were uh, uh, put together in, I think, March of 2012 with the idea that we would uh, finish our work by August 1st of that year. Uh, we were not able to do that even though we had uh, 18 months to complete it. We did complete our work in March of 2013 and we made some recommendations and because of the timing we made some recommendations to uh, City Council in June and they agreed to put uh, the recommendations that we made to, the, uh, to vote uh, in this election uh, to the Hartford residents. And so uh, we met, if you see on the, uh, uh, the, the ballot, there's three questions uh, about the charter revision. And so they took our recommendations, city council took our recommendations and broke it into really three parts, which were uh, they separated our issues about public financing of local elected officials, and they separated that from the recommendations as a separate question. They separated uh, some recommendations about the rest of voters, and they took those recommendations and separated it from the, uh, up the, the general recommendations. And so, and then they had the third part, which is all the other recommendations besides the one on the rest of voters and besides the one on the campaign financing. And so that's why you have three questions. Uh, uh, 
So we have one rec we have one, uh, we made a, a, a number of recommendations and based on the recommendations, they took that and they separated it into three questions. And uh, I believe that you can vote separately on the three questions so that you can affect possibly, uh, for example, uh, the recommendations that we've made outside of those two recommendations of public finance and rest of voters can actually pass and those other two recommendations <clears throat> say may not pass. So again, uh, you're not voting on one piece in terms of, uh, of all the recommendations that we, that we made. Uh, I took a quick review of the, uh, uh, the uh, Hartford voter uh, organization and the uh, breakdown in terms of uh, the questions uh, based on the recommendations. And I think that they, they did a very good job of really explaining some of the major recommendations that we're making uh, on the uh, uh, charter revision. So uh, I think this is, is a very good handout. And, I, and I, I have to tell you that since the questions for the ballot has been made public, I have uh, gotten a few calls uh, based on the wording of the question for the ballot, which I think uh, are confusing people already. So um, hopefully they'll, they'll uh, get clear on that. But I don't really want to go through all of the recommendations, but I do want to say that uh, the register of voters, we are not recommending that we don't have register of voters. Uh, that was one of the, I think, some of the questions I've been getting calls on. Uh, we're recommending that the register of voters, and there was some debate in the, in the uh, commission about how a register of voters should be appointed. But basically what we're suggesting is that Hartford uh, doesn't necessarily need three or four or five register of voters, depending on state law, where uh, uh, state law requires, I think, a majority party of the town to have a register of voters and a minority party. Uh, and I think uh, since we have three, it's because the working families member uh, got more votes than a Republican uh, member. And so since the Democrats and Republicans, in a sense, were guaranteed the spot, we ended up with three registered voters. Uh, we uh, discussed that quite a bit uh, as the commissioners, and we felt that the registered voters should be a uh, more professionalized position that uh, I, I can't say nonpartisan because the person may be a registered uh, member of a party, but we would like uh, to suggest that the office become professionalized to increase voter turnout, uh, voter access, regardless of the registration of the person, and that that person has a professional staff that uh, is responsible for uh, uh, voter education, uh, election day responsibilities, and protection of all voters in Hartford so that they can have some uh, assistance that is responsible to make sure that the majority party interest is, is, is held, and also the minority parties, no matter how many of those minority parties, that their uh, interests are also being uh, uh, held uh, and looked at and, and protected. So we thought that uh, the rest of voters should be a professional office. Uh, we had a lot of discussion on how that person should be uh, selected. Uh, the recommendation is that the council select it, uh, but we suggested to the council that they can create that position as a professional position through the personnel department. That would be up to council. So we actually gave council some latitude as to how they want to appoint the person. So even though the charter is recommended that the council is responsible for the appointment of the register of voters, uh, they can say, no, the, the, the way we want the register of, voter, uh, register of voters, the head register of voters, they can suggest that it be a personnel a professional position out of personnel and just uh, um, create the outline in terms of uh, what they will want in those job specifications. So there is some latitude. The idea is that if you have one professional register of voters that was responsible for the office and then they would hire the people that they need to carry out the functions of that. So that, that's the register of voters piece. The uh, public finances of uh, local elections, Again, uh, with the rest of voters as well with the campaign finance, we will have to look at some changes in some of the state laws to be able to, to, to do that. The state allows for uh, towns uh, to create a demonstration project for some local, uh, uh, some public finances of local, uh, local elected officials. 
Uh, there was not a lot of towns that was knocking down the state door to say, let, let me be part of this demonstration project. I believe New Haven was one that I think is trying it. So uh, this, the city can currently go to the state and ask to be a part of this demonstration part project of funding uh, local candidates through a public financing structure. And so we're recommending that the city seek out that information to find out uh, it would, would it be in the city's best interest to have it. And if that was to pass, uh, that would direct the city council to go and ask for the process to have a public financing of local, uh, local candidates. Uh, so those are the two separate questions. And again, uh, the information that you have outlines some of the other stuff that we recommended that has to do with the mayor's salary, uh, the uh, council president, the mayor's salary with, and the treasurer's salary that we're tying it into the salaries of the uh, appellate court judge and superior court judge so that uh, you may recall that there was some debate on the salary of the treasurers a, a few years ago. We would like to take the debate out of the uh, uh, politics for the salaries of the, of the mayor and the treasurer. And so they just tied into the uh, uh, salaries of the appellate court, court judge and superior court judge. And that way it's, it's no longer based on uh, the city council voting on their salaries which they don't do on the mayor, but they do on the treasurer. Uh, <clears throat> we uh, also are recommending that the mayor uh, can still appoint, again, a considerable debate, that the mayor can still appoint uh, the five members for the Board of Education, but the mayor uh, could sit on the board as a non-voting member, as officio. So the mayor gets to appoint the five, but the mayor uh, cannot appoint himself and sit on the board as a, as a voting member. So you can sit on the board as an S officio with non voting powers. So that's the recommendations uh, that we have. And as uh, Ms. Simmons uh, just uh, stated, we have a Board of Education coming up, uh, election coming up next week. We have four uh, public uh, seats available for election. We only have four candidates that's running. So it's almost, uh, you know, again, uh, when we change the charter to have five members elected by the board, uh, you know, again, I got a lot of questions about people wanting to have some participation in voting on board members. And as you can see, you only got four members running for four spots. It's not much of a debate for the residents of the city of Hartford and the parents of the city of Hartford as to what candidate might be best served. So uh, I'm not so sure. We, you know, we, we thought in 2002 that this was the way to go. And, uh, you know, in my opinion, when we change the charter, we want to try to increase participation not uh, from the residents, not decrease it. And I got to tell you that I'm saddened by only four people from the city of Hartford wanting to run for Board of Education for four spots. It doesn't leave a lot of discussions as to uh, who our uh, education leaders may be for the interests of our, of our residents. Uh, but this is what we, in a sense, created. So we have to be very careful, I think, sometimes uh, when we do these things. Uh, I really am not going to go over the rest of the recommendations. They're really they're, they're, they're spelled out very well in that, that uh, uh, handout that you have. If you have a minute to, to browse it, uh, I think we would rather have some discussion about those kind of recommendations, and I think the panel wants to uh, weigh in on their views on it um, at this point. Uh, Attorney Mednick is here if he wants to add anything. Thank you. Should I just? Yes, go right into? ahead. Why don't you comment on? Anything you think needs our attention. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my pleasure to be here today. Um, what I'll do is I'll try to go through some of the other changes uh, that uh, Ken uh, did not go through. But I, I do want to emphasize something because there was an awful lot of um, misstatement um, initially regarding what the commission did with regard to registrar of voters. I didn't catch your name. My name is Steve Mednick. I was the counsel to the Charter Revision Commission. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm a private attorney. I've done charter revision for all the largest cities in the state of Connecticut except for Stanford. Uh, this is my third Hartford charter revision. The Charter Commission had a, 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 the ability to hire its own private counsel to support uh, the work we were doing, and we hired uh, Attorney Mendel. 
So, so one of the points I wanted to make is that there was an awful lot of controversy at our public hearings regarding what we did, what the Commission did with respect to the Registrar of Voters. The um, current charter has a provision that was adopted in 2002 that permits the Council to do what, we, what this Commission was accused of doing, and that is uh, provide for the appointment of registrars or constables. There are two different positions in the City of Hartford. So this Commission did nothing to modify that standard. That standard is in the Charter today. And uh, all they did was adopt a provision that said that the Council, uh, if the statutes permit it, and the statutes do not permit it at this point, um, can make the appointment um, for the appointed registrar in the event there is an appointed uh, registrar permitted by state law. The other thing that they did, and Ken talked about this briefly, is it really the charter provision, if adopted with regard to um, the registrar voters, uh, kind of moves in the direction of nonpartisan um, and um, professional standards to be applied to the office, to try to depoliticize the office, even if the office remains an elective office um, with, um, quote, partisan members to try to provide these services on a nonpartisan basis and on a fair basis. And most, frankly, most registrar's offices throughout the state of Connecticut uh, pretty much operate that way. Uh, it's, I think the commission felt it was important to establish a constitutional standard in the charter. The, um, uh, we talked a little bit about, in 2002, the Commission came up with a standard for um, addressing compensation for the mayor in particular. At that point, the mayor had not had a salary increase in some years, and salaries had always been kind of a political hot potato, and they established a standard back in 2002 that um, made the mayor's salary equivalent to the salary of a Superior Court judge. Uh, that was changed in this cycle so that the mayor will now have a salary that it, the, the, base of the base of the salary will be equal to an appellate court judge. The treasurer will have a salary because the treasurer's salary is, again, the political hot potato that will be equal to a superior court judge, and the council would be entitled to uh, an escalator um, uh, on compensation for uh, it's based on a consumer price index, so it would be a very marginal increase that they were, they'd be permitted. But they were only permitted in the four-year term uh, prior to the commencement of the term and after the third year of a term. You can't increase a person's compensation on a regular basis. It has to be, it's governed by the state constitution. Um, the council has an expanded role in appointments to boards and commissions. Um, th this is a very, this is a new provision. This is uh, probably more akin to what is done in the legislature with commission appointments, the mayor will now have a bare majority of the appointments to boards and commissions. The council will have the remainder of the appointments, and they're going to have to work out an ordinance if this is adopted to work out the transition to um, uh, to the uh, to to that uh, new standard. The an another issue that they addressed was expanding eligibility. Uh, for participation on boards and commissions uh, beyond um, beyond mere citizenship, beyond citizenship to uh, people who fall into various categories. Let me see if I can find them quickly I here. I have it if you want. No, I have it right here. Um, where you can either be an elector of the city, a resident, at least 18 years of, uh, of age, who is a citizen, a lawful permanent resident, or a refugee or asylee. The idea was to expand uh, participation, not for elective office, but for a point of, point of <coughs> office beyond the citizenship standard. Um, there's uh, the council will now have, um, now that it has shared appointment authority, it has removal of authority for those people that the council appoints to boards and commissions, if this is adopted. Um, it kind of provided additional foundation for the internal audit, uh, the audit commission. You have two very unique positions in the city of Hartford that I have not seen in any of the other cities that I represent. One is the audit commission, um, the, internal, the internal audit commission, and the other is your elected treasurer. Um, the charter language um, 
uh, attempts to provide e a greater foundation for operational and financial independence for the Audit Commission uh, to assure that, uh, that uh, the level of funding is never reduced from the level that it had received from the council and the mayor in the prior year. The idea is to um, insulate it from the political process. So if the Internal Audit Commission is conducting investigations and inquiries into the council or into the mayor, that they cannot um, reduce their expenditures. They've also created um, set of special circumstances where the Audit Commission can come and seek additional funds for investigations um, and for uh, outside co consultants to assist in those investigations. The other issue that the Commission uh, addressed that had not been addressed in the past is established a constitutional standard for a city ethics commission, created an ethics commission in the charter. Again, like the Internal Audit Committee, I think that the commission uh, wanted to make sure that there was an, a watchdog. And what's significant about an ethics commission is, is um, you know, right now it's discretionary whether you adopt it or don't adopt it by, st by ordinance is entirely up to a city council. I think you have one, but it is now going to be required. And what's significant about an ethics commission, it's the, one of the few bodies um, at the local level that is granted statutory uh, subpoena authority. And so that is going to be mandated in the charter. Uh, the pension commission will have a non-voting representative of retired city employees elected by those folks um, who, uh, by, by, non, by retired city employees, will have that position on the pension commission. Um, there is a greater ability for the city council, the board of education, and the treasurer to hire outside counsel. There's standards that are clearly delineated in the charter. <clears throat> the commission was also mindful of the fact that it shouldn't be hiring lawyers who have a direct conflict um, under the code of professional responsibility with the uh, with the city, so that it it has not a Corporation Council veto, but a Corporation Council um, uh, admonition if, in fact, somebody does have a conflict of interest, the Corporation Council um, can, in effect, stop the hiring, but has to state in public, in writing, what the actual legal conflict of interest is. It can't be that the attorney is not a friend of the mayor or the council president or the chairman of the Board of Education. It has to be a genuine um, conflict of interest. Um, I think Ken talked about the mayor's reduced role um, as an odd ad hoc member of the Board of Education, non-voting ad hoc member of the Board uh, of Education. There's a provision in here that clarifies council authority with, re re with regard to the modification of expenditures and revenue line items in the proposed budget. There is, there's been a um, kind of a tug and pull between the executive and legislative branches over this authority. Frankly, as an attorney who's looked at this, this is my third charter revision in Hartford, I thought it was relatively clear. Uh, members of the council felt they needed more clarity, and it is certainly more clear now than it, than it was uh, then. Uh, those are the major, um, the, the, the other thing I want to point out with regard to the uh, ballot question with respect to the public financing of campaigns, um, th th that was a widely debated issue within the commission. And I think that the majority of the commission felt that it was important to make a statement um, that clearly, clearly uh, uh, sought the city establishment of this and required the establishment uh, of this uh, to the extent um, that, the, again, that the program is authorized and permitted by the general statutes. Um, and so, so long as they are permitted to do it, uh, the charter would require the Court of Common Council to enact an ordinance that would implement a system of public financing, um, I think, of all offices uh, in the city um, to, I think, all offices. You know, the mayor, city treasurer, and city council, not the board of education. Um, constable? Not constable Why and not, not registered voters. I don't know. I, I don't have a vote on these things. But the- uh, not, uh, not board of ed? Uh, I don't believe Board of Ed was included. I'm in just there. telling you. you can, I'm just telling you what it is. I'm right. not debating you. No, I'm just asking. I, 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 yeah. I wasn't sure. Yeah, I'm just uh, telling I, you what's I in there. I didn't have a day and a half to read this thing, so I, I 
Um, the, and so that, that is, uh, there's now a mandate for the council to pursue that. And, uh, and then the final ballot question relating to the operational standards is what I talked about earlier. The operational standards are that a registrar of voters must adhere to um, uh, uh, professional standards. There are national standards that are adopted that can be adopted, that can, that, that can be uh, melded for local use. But the objective is to make sure that if the office is preserved as it is today, and as the statute would require it to remain preserved, that, uh, that it operate in, a, in, uh, in accordance with best pra practices and the highest professional standards uh, available. And that there's, uh, it also requires participation in whatever cer certification training programs there are by the state of Connecticut. So that is uh, kind of a uh, long-winded summary. Okay. And can I just add two quick pieces? Um, if you don't mind. I don't okay. Uh, I, I've been talking to a lot of people about the register of voters and that we're trying to get rid of um, the register of voters. The commission, you know, we're, we're not trying to get rid of anybody. We're just trying to respond to some of the um, questions that uh, was posed to us to look at. Uh, the register of voters is, is the office is a state position. It's in state law in terms of how it operates. And as I said earlier, it almost guarantees a majority party uh, register and a minority party register. And people say, well, <clears throat> the city is asking for it to be changed. The, the reality is that uh, the state legislator can change it at any time. So it's not just a city issue. If, if folks wanted to change the office of the register of voters across the state, any state representative, any state official in the General Assembly could put in a bill to change the law. So it's not really just Harford in terms of saying they wanted to change. You know, uh, so people say, well, the, the law won't change unless Hartford initiates it, which is really not true. It's a state law which can be changed by state officials at any time. Uh, and then uh, we, the Ethics Commission, we feel uh, we wanted to strengthen it because, uh, as I've been made aware, uh, just recently with the Treasurer's Office, and it concerns me that the Treasurer has an appointment on the Internal Audit Commission that may have to investigate the Treasurer's Office. And these are the kind of things that uh, hopefully an ethics commission can just keep keep us aware of that's stronger. So when people say, well, you know, how, you know, uh, what avenue do we have if we had these kind of questions, I would hope that the ethics commission can help us uh, through those kind of process. Thank you. Okay. Um, I remember uh, when I served on the city council, it was the first time we established an ethics commission, and we did a lot of research, but you cannot anticipate all the questions that will come up. So some of this is to answer questions that have transpired in those uh, in so many years, many years. Um, now what we wanted to do first was to um, have a, um, pa a three panelists from you know different perspectives uh, talk about um, their response to these and raise issues that they have. Um, I would like to ask them um, to maybe take about five to seven minutes each at the most um, to uh, give their response to these. And then we can have question and answer dialogue and so on. And we want to you know, answer as many questions that the audience may have as well. So let's go in the order of the program. Um, and first, let's hear from uh, Ken Krajewski, the executive director of the New Haven Democracy Fund. Tell us what New Haven democracy Thank has you. to do with Hartford, too. Um, there are, I'm a Hartford resident. I live in Asylum Hill, and I'm an attorney. And by a very good stroke of fortune, I was named the administrator of the New Haven Democracy Fund in July of 2012. This is important to Hartford because New Haven is the only city that has taken up the municipal campaign financing opportunity available to municipalities under the clean elections program that former Representative Green uh, spoke about. There's only 16 or 17 cities in the United States that have tried uh, public campaign financing. New York City's is the most robust public campaign finance program in the country for city elections. Uh, Bill de Blasio is about to be elected mayor, seemingly, under the campaign finance board. New York City has a six to one match, meaning if you give $150 to Bill de Blasio or Christine Quinn or whoever, 
the campaign finance board matches that six to one. I'm not really good at math, but I think it's about $1,250 to $150. The New York City campaign finance board has been in existence for about 30 years. New Haven's democracy fund, of which I am administrator, came into existence in 2006, shortly after the clean elections program was passed. In the four elections since 2006, uh, this election in 2013 has been the most successful for the Democracy Fund and has seen the most robust participation from candidates. Uh, up until this year, the Democracy Fund had only given away $47,000 to candidates. This year, one candidate alone got $54,000 in public campaign financing out of a total of about $110,000 that the city gave away to uh, high school principal, a state representative, and an alderman. So I see public campaign financing as a path that needs to be tested on municipal levels. Everybody, including the Hartford Current uh, editorial board that speaks against it says, oh, we can't afford it. And I would counter that corruption is not cheap and we can't afford corruption either. I think any of us in this room who are experienced political watchers and I look out across this room, I see a lot of people who are very active in politics and I thank you all for coming tonight and I thank Hartford Votes and Louise and my fellow panelists for joining me up here. Um, we couldn't quantify what John Rowland's corruption cost the state of Connecticut. We would be hard pressed to quantify what uh, Eddie Perez's corruption cost the city of Hartford in terms of lost dollars, in terms of lost opportunities, in terms of redirected resources in order to defend this, and in terms of, you know, uh, hand wringing. We can eliminate the idea of pay to play politics, which is as old as quid pro quo, the, the Latin phrase, this for that. This isn't a new concept that you give a campaign donation to a politician, it's big enough to get his attention, he's gonna turn around and do something for you. Anybody who's paying attention saw the Speaker of the House of uh, Representatives of Connecticut get his hand caught in the cookie jar. He had plausible deniability, but certainly his chief of staff didn't and is about to do 28 to 30 months in a federal penitentiary. We're looking at a system that's not gonna change. Capital gets what capital wants because it can move money around. So right now we have capital buying elections. We need people to buy elections. When people buy elections, politicians are accountable to people, not private dollars. Public campaign financing is about people and citizens buying elections. And from my perspective, the million dollars, it'll cost $250,000 a year over the quadrennial election cycle. You need about a million dollars every four years to run a publicly, campaign, a publicly financed election in the city of Hartford. From where I sit, that's a heck of a lot cheaper than watching day after day of headlines of the city's chief elected official in the, the courthouse on Lafayette Street. And to me, when you have publicly financed elections, you have a candidate who has to pass a threshold of public support. My friend to the right here is gonna say, oh, it's welfare for politicians. It's much cheaper welfare for politicians than relying on contractors and people who have an agenda supporting those politicians. So I am firmly in favor of public campaign financing and that is what I'm here to talk about because I think we need to test it. The system that we have now is not responsive to the needs of the general population. We need to try other alternatives. If this fails, I'm more than happy to admit my idea didn't work but we can't do that until we try something different. And I would ask that the people who are watching this on TV, the people in this room, tell your friends and family and say, look, let's try something different. Let's try something new. Thank you. Okay. And, um, okay, if you want to take a moment. Uh, and our next panelist is Michael McGarry, who is the chair of the Hartford Republican Party and a former city council. Well, I've been accused of being a bit of a grouch once in a while. Who is a grouch who smiles? I have one grouch. All these panels put together by voter voter tend to be of the left. All these gentlemen, ladies, are of the political left. I'm the only one that would be a centrist or political right. 
Shouldn't be that way. You've got Steve Betterfonte, head of redevelopment. You've got Sandy over here, who's the head of um, uh, what is it? zoning board, zoning. planning and zoning. You've got Rich Waring at a board of education. Why am I the only Republican here? Doesn't make any sense. Or even a conservative Democrat. There's none of those here. It's not the way to run a panel. A panel should be balanced. I had nothing to do with well, the composition of the, the idea. Panel. You pick the <laughs> pick the woman running the panel who obviously is a woman of the left. No you're, question. You're See that? All right, now. I'm just an agnostic. Here. All right. Now. So, Mike, now, let's, no get reason, let's get on with that. But there, that should be stated. Now, this whole idea of this election is very bogus. The reason they changed this whole idea of, elect, of voting on these things to contested elections was to get a better turnout. This is not a contested election. No. There's nobody running for a board of ed. There may be a writing candidate, I guess, but that's negligible. The idea that we're going to have a real election is bogus. This is not a bogus, it's a bogus election. Maybe we'll get 3% turnout. Maybe. If we get 3% turnout, that means 1.5% plus 1 will make all these relatively dramatic changes. And they're dramatic changes. The whole idea that anybody, other than maybe you who are interested, is going to read all this stuff, right. it took these guys a half an hour or 31 minutes to explain it. 31 minutes. You're going to do that at 6 in the morning on a way to go to work? No. This should not even be on the ballot. But it is because, let's face it, the council didn't know that it was going to be bogus back in July. So the only way to make this a true, if you go in there, this is not democracy, so vote no, no, no. No matter what you think of these somewhat convoluted questions and answers, you should vote no, no, no. Saying to those that are trying to, for some reason, sneak some of these odd changes in, you can't do it this way. Democracy is when everybody votes. If these are important changes, and I agree they're all important changes, they should be on next year's ballot. When you have a hotly contested, contested gubernatorial election, when we can ask the state reps and state senators, what do you think, because there's some state law involved, it would be a much better election to do this when people are awake and aware. Now they're like a couple of the audience that fell asleep during this 30 minutes of explanations. So are you really going to read this? Two sides of single spaced, must be 800 words here, at 6 in the morning. That won't be in a polling place. Linda, will this be in a polling place? No. I don't know. You can't have that in a polling place. The only thing you can have in a polling place at 6 in the morning when you're running for your coffee, when you're late for work, that's what's going to be in a polling place. And if one person out of 10,000, well, we're not going to have 10,000 votes. Maybe we'll have 2,000 votes. If one person out of 2,000 actually reads all this, I'd be amazed. Now, let me hit all three issues quickly. First of all, the first one is so odd and so many different things. You know, each one needs a lot of debate. Now, and there are some blank checks. If you read what it has to say about these salaries, we as voters have no control over it. That'll be state. The state will set those various salaries. And, and the, uh, the idea that we would do it with cost of living, who knows what that would be. So essentially, we're giving blank checks. And we give a blank check this idea that we're going to have three or four different corporation councils. That's another. Who knows what that's going to cost? Who knows going to appoint them? You know? And who knows what the outcome would be? Imagine four different corporation councils. That's kind of no, because we'd always be in conflict. If the council gets mad at the mayor, it's going to bring a lawyer in. We know what happens when we bring lawyers in. You know? <laughs> so anyhow, well, I think that whole thing is just odd. If you read them, they kind of all contradict each other. And they all are very, very debatable and should be debated in a real election, which this is not. Now, the second one, Ken, I hate to disagree with you. You're I'm a good shocked. guy. You're shocked. shocked. But <laughs> the idea that he would rather pay politicians off than fix the roof of City Hall is kind of cuckoo. We're going to be laying off people next year. Unless the unions, I heard this this morning, yes, the unions take the deals that the mayor wants to give them, there's going to be massive layoffs again in the city. We're already down to bare bones. 205 people in public works, and the dam to flood control is in trouble. We can't afford $30,000 a year to cut the trees on the dike. And we're going to spend $200,000, $400,000, a million. Who knows? What if there's 25 candidates for council in the Democratic primary? They're all going to get some money. 
What if 25 candidates run independent, Republican, Democrat, and working families? We had 25 last time. What are we going to give them? Five? 10? 15? It takes $15,000 to run a decent campaign for council. Now, the whole idea that Eddie was influenced by the guy who sent him to jail, that had nothing to do with it. Sorry, misstatement, Mr. Lawyer. It wasn't his campaign contributions. The guy gave him a kitchen, for Christ's sake. It didn't have anything to do with the election. He gave him a kitchen. Now, I don't like the idea that elections can be bought, but they're not always bought. Bloomberg, who he quotes, Bloomberg spent a fortune against that poor guy that ran against him, the guy that most beat him. Remember, in New York City? So it's not always money and contributions. Two minutes, let me get through the other one. But the worst of all is taking away our right to vote for registrar voters. I don't think anybody realized that in the last go around. But we have a right now to vote to register the voters. They want to take away that right. That's not correct. The voters decided that we'd have three registrars. It wasn't us. It wasn't Republicans or Democrats. We weren't the families. It was the voters that decided that. We want to take away that right. That's not correct. Now, we Republicans were at fault. We didn't run a strong candidate. We didn't understand our candidate was going to retire. Had we run a strong candidate, we wouldn't be here tonight. And had the Democrats run a strong candidate, the organizational Democrats, and beat the incumbent, we wouldn't be here tonight. This whole thing is because a faction of the Democratic Party doesn't like the Democratic registrar. That's the truth. That's why we're going through this. And who's going to be the checks and balances? Where would we have checks and balances with a political appointee? I don't care what you call him. It's a political appointee would be the registrar of voters. He would be hired by the council and mayor, maybe in kind of, we're working together, but five votes on council will put their guy or gal in. Who would that guy or gal answer to? When there's a pile of ballots sitting there that are questionable, where do you think he's going to bend? He's going to bend to the guy that pays his salary. Of course. I was, I knew Mayor Mike. I knew who Mayor Mike would have put in. Remember Carrie <laughs> Perry? Who do you think Carrie would have put in? Now, I'll tell you, if I had the five votes, I know who I'd put in. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and our next, uh, our next panelist is Luther Weeks, Executive Director of Connecticut Voters Count. Okay. So, you know, I think all of us come from the same things, but we have our priorities in a different way sometimes. My first priority is voting integrity and credibility. I'm also interested in increasing participation in democracy. I'm interested in the cost of things and managing costs. And I'm interested in practicality in what we do in laws, et cetera. Uh, but sometimes people take one of those uh, you know, too strong a way. They're only interested in costs, or they're only interested in increasing turnout, uh, maybe uh, falsely because it's their party or suppressing another party. So I happen to be a registered Democrat. Uh, I'm not a Hartford resident. Uh, but I agree with uh, Democrats about half the time, Republicans about half the time, the Secretary of State about half the time, and registrars of voters about half the time on everything. Uh, so I'm only here to talk about one issue. I think it's a huge mistake to change to an appointed a registrar of voters uh, for a city, especially appointed by a town council for a city. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say why I think the state has the law the way it is. Uh, you know, I don't know when it was passed years ago, long before anyone alive today was. But why do you need two registrars in the first place? You need those checks and balances. Okay, the state says the top two vote getters will be uh, registrars. Why do you need a working families and party uh, registrar in Connecticut to check and balance the Democratic registrar? Because the working families is really, uh, you know, an alternative to the Democratic Party, and it is the second biggest party in Hartford. Uh, you need somebody watching out for the interests of the voters and the candidates uh, in democracy. You need a check and balance. You need somebody for that. So why do you need a Republican registrar in Hartford if you got those two? Well, even if you take it as a given that the Republicans are not going to be a viable party or active enough to make a big difference in Hartford, 
uh, which I don't know is ever going to last forever. Things change. Uh, but, you know, it's my interest as a resident not in Hartford that the interests of the Republican Party be watched out for in Hartford. It's your interest as voters in Hartford, even if you're Democrats, that the Democrats register, Democratic Party interests be watched out for in a very conservative town, uh, say in Litchfield. Okay? Uh, that's why you need to, uh, to watch out for those interests. Uh, yeah, here we have uh, a good example. We got a question on the ballot. A question that has something to do with your charter that's supported by the town council. Would you want them appointing who that registrar is that's going to be in charge of that? Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to return to some of that. Uh, but, you know, a lot of the issue is around cost here. A lot of the issue, where I first heard the issue was in the Hartford Current. And before the Working Families Party registrar won the election four years ago, they were already editorializing. Okay, I disagree with their premise that having an appointed registrar is cheaper than having uh, a, three elected registrars. We have 169 towns in the state of Connecticut. Most of those towns have two part-time registrars, some very part-time. Okay, there's no reason that it has to cost money just because you elect a third registrar. That's not creativity. Creativity is let the registrars work two thirds of the time. Let them each have a deputy if they want to have less assistance. Let the deputies work two thirds of the time. If the registrars want to work full time, three of them, then they should be able to work out less staff reporting to them to make your budget about the same. But I do agree with Ken, it's a small cost, uh, you know, for integrity. I mean, we're talking a lot less money here. Um, I want to mention. That one other thing about me, I'm a certified moderator. That means that I essentially have a license to run a polling place in Connecticut or count absentee ballots. There's no certification of registrars in Connecticut. No registrars are even required to be certified to meet the level that I have to to run a polling place. Okay? It's nice to say in a charter revision that if there was a state certification program, they have to attend within 180 days of being appointed. Uh, that some national one, they have to attend. Attend, it doesn't even say they have to satisfactorily complete such a program if it even exists. 180 days, town council can appoint a new registrar or registrars right before an election. They can appoint them between an election and the re and the certification if they wanted to. Uh, you know, there's no limit on creativity. They could appoint three of them. They could appoint five of them. They could appoint one, but that one could spend too much money right then and there. Um, I'd also add that it's hard to change the straight law. It's not as simple as changing one little thing. Right now, you have a Republican and a Democrat in every polling place. We have some working families people called assistant registrars. That's the only watchdog in the polling place. The rest of the people are not required. They're nonpartisan. Okay? Who's going to report the Democrats and the Republicans in the polling place or the working families, people in the polling place to watch out for those interests in there? It could be done, but that's a change. That's a complex change to the state law. There's other things in the state law. It's not as simple as it looks. Uh, the, the bottom line is I do agree we ought to professionalize our election management, but there's a better way to do it, more like what we've done with probate. Regionalize it, professionalize it, economize it, but build a thing where you have a job uh, career path so you can train people that really understand this. You aren't just grabbing somebody and giving that job with no certification, no career path. So I say vote no on, I guess that's the third question. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, now, uh, what we'd like to do is take questions um, from the audience. If you have a booming voice, our mic can pick you up. If not, if you could come, you don't have to come right up to the mic, but if you could just come to the front, uh, that would make life easier. If you'd rather just stand up and ask. 
Yeah, it, it, actually that makes sense. Why don't, why don't we line up? So let's have you first, since you put your hand up first. And uh, come forward. I'm gonna make it short and quick. No, no, where you are is good. No, no, right, right okay. That's right. right there is fine, thank you very much. We just want to make sure we get your voice on the table. Okay, I'm gonna make this short and quick. Since I've been voting, it's all been a game, okay? No one is serious. No one cares. No one who cares, you know. I'm not liking it. Now this gentleman here, this gentleman here, this gentleman here, and that gentleman. Matter of fact, all of you, if you are serious, get it done. Make it work. I am so tired of the backwardness. Forward, not backwards. You now I know you know that I know that this country it's backwards, right? Come on, somebody say it. Come on. Yes. Let me hear it. No. Yes. It's yes. backwards. I don't agree with you at all. It right. is backwards <laughs> since the 70s. Okay. We got to go forward. We got to keep this country from going down. You have to think about the people. You have to think about the citizens. You have to think about the voters. Stop thinking about yourselves. Does anybody want to respond? Well, I'll respond first. Uh, you know what? I'll give you the history of Hartford. When the Working Families Party got the vote, the mill rate, with the votes of control of the council, mill rate was around 30. When Republicans lost their control, mill rate was 30. What's the mill rate now? 74. So to see, when you go off these tangents to the left, like the city did, it got what it deserved, a 74 mill rate. What businesses come to the city in 74 mills? We don't see very many. How can people stand 74 mills if their housing taxes go up to 74, like many people want? What will happen? <laughs> so you see, I'll give you a partisan argument. If we had good Democrats and good Republicans, much better city. Every city in the state of Connecticut that has a balance between Republican and Democrat is run well. The cities that have a way off balance, the Democratic Party, are in trouble all over the state. I'm unaffiliated. I am not registered with any party because of my position in the city of New Haven. I would counter that Republicanism is a dying ideology in this country, <laughs> given its recent performance in Washington, D.C. What I would suggest is that uh, this good citizen here has said that government isn't working for her. The interests of the people have been neglected in many corners and many quarters of our country. And I counter that this is because, if her statement is to be taken as true, is because our elections are not responsive to the citizens. There's been more than one study by more than one political scientist who said government is responsive to donors and not to voters. Our elections must not be for sale. And I don't have, as I said, I don't have opinions on the other two pieces of charter. I know that we need to make changes in the way that we conduct our elections. The rules by which we finance candidates predict the negative outcomes that we're going to have within our legislative and executive bodies. So I would counter and I would suggest that our answer to getting a more responsive government and to creating a more responsive society to the needs of people, whether your issue is student loan debt or your issue is health care or your issue is simply bike lanes. Getting people in there who are not accountable to private donors, but are accountable to the taxpayer fisc is how we do this. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think, you know, I think myself and some of us here, I'm sure, wake up every day thinking about voters. Okay, and wishing more people would vote. And, you know, an unopposed four people for the Board of Education says, some people say that's okay. You know, how hard would it be to get on the Board of Education if 2 or 3% of people are going to vote on this election? You know, get on the ballot. Get, get some people together. Unless you're completely happy with those four candidates, then democracy must be working for you. Okay, why don't we line up 
and and just uh, you don't have to come right up close, but if we could just line up for fine, the questions, right. I think this is fine. Okay, great. Okay, I'm assuming that the reason that this is on the ballot this year is because of the, of the charter demands that it be addressed this this year. In other words, that we couldn't have put it off. I'm not sure. I think the law, because the uh, law says that the charter has to, uh, the city has to propose something every 10 years, and the last one was 2002. They had to do something this year. Okay. And there's some time frames in terms of once they finish, if they, they could have ignored it and not put it on the ballot and waited wait within another 10 years. Yeah, you know, they could have ignored it. There, there's some argument that the council could have accepted the report of the charter commission, and then set the election for this charter to be a year and a half after it was adopted. But I think that um, Hartford had an experience back in 2000 where it had a special election for a charter revision in December, and it passed overwhelmingly, but it didn't get the 15%. Um, and I think that this commission simply, and, and the council simply made a decision that this is a regular election. It is a general election. It's not a special election. If people choose not to show up for general elections, the council can't make predictions about what people are going to do or not do. And I think that it just made a decision that it was acted upon, uh, and I don't want to speak for the city council, uh, that it was acted upon this year, and to delay it to the next general election, even though I think the arguments are compelling that there's more activity. At the, at the same time, it could also get lost in that cycle. You could make an argument that in this cycle, this would have been the cycle for people who really wanted to debate it to try to raise the public consciousness. Uh, and I live in New Haven, so I haven't seen whether there are campaigns. Uh, but the, the reason it's on the ballot this year is it was finished this year. And to put it off for uh, a year and a half after its completion, uh, one would argue that you might be ignoring it or you might miss it. Hey, Louise, let me comment on that. May I, may I just add? Okay, let me finish. May I, follow, I just okay. want to follow yeah. up because if we vote no, 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 as Mr. McGarry suggested, what happens then? Does it go into the next 10 no. year no, cycle? It's done. It's done. Well, it's, it's done. There's a misnomer about the 10 year cycle. The right. charter, it's not state law, the charter requires that you have one at least every 10 right. years. Mm -hmm. You can have a charter. I was in New Britain several years ago. We did a charter every year on different elements of the charter for three or four years. Waterbury, we did the same. And years ago in Bridgeport, I did the same. So you can have a charter revision every year. I don't recommend it. Uh, but you can, you can do it uh, often. Um, you shouldn't do it that often. But you, you, under your charter, have to do it every 10 years. What happens if you don't? Uh, well, uh, there's no, uh, no real penalty if you don't, but you, but you should. Uh, David, the reason I, I think that this is a, a bogus election is that there several of these are state-oriented, need some state action, or at least our state reps and state senators should comment on these things before they become law. And obviously they're not this time. Haven't heard any state senator or state representative say anything about these. Because they're now, not running. Yeah, and remember, the last election, somebody lost by one vote. He's on this panel, correct? Two. One, two votes. Another guy won because of a tie. So the opinions, although not that many people may be involved in these kind of things, the opinions of just a very few people would make a huge difference to state reps and state senators. That's where they should be dealing with these issues before it goes up for a general vote. Okay. One, one last comment, please. Okay. When we propose that a, any elected official that we pay a salary to be at another level I, we, I'd like to know what that costs. I mean, we, I don't even know what the mayor makes. I think he makes 125000 Is that correct? Roughly? I think it's like one hundred fifty. It's more like one hundred forty-five hundred. 4500 So he makes as much as the governor, essentially. So we're saying that he ought to be at the rate of an appellate court judge. What is that going to cost? Is that lower than what he's getting now? Probably It's not. about the same, right? It's about the same. Okay. But I think the dollars and cents, in whatever literature we prepare, it ought to be something that we can okay. That's good put some people. Thank you. Yes. That's a good thought. Come forward. Good evening. My name is Raquel Calderon, and I represent the 6th District Town Committee in South End. Uh, I have been away, and I wasn't aware of this, but I'm really troubled for everything that I hear and how fast everything is going. I would like to know whose idea was this to turn over 
this decision to have that one person or the city council is going to appoint the registered reporters no, instead, instead of the, you know, instead of being elected by, by the town, by the, the, the citizens? The, the two people Who here. Who was responsible for this? I would like to know. Okay. The, the Charter Revision uh, Commission was formed in March of 2012. So we've been meeting since March of 2012 on all of these items and whatever. And one of the things that we did is we did outreach. We did outreach to the Democratic Town Committee, all of its members. When we first met, we gave them a list of what would you like for us to discuss since you're part of the Democratic Town Committee, and we asked them, and, and any other people that came to our meetings, we asked them what were their priorities, what were they interested in. So if you're a member of the Democratic Town Committee, you should have been made aware of these are the 20 items that we were going to discuss, and they gave us feedback. That was in March of 2012. We had four public hearings since March of 2012. We had to meet with the city council twice in a public meeting before we could uh, make recommendations and anybody was invited to be at. So we tried to do the outreach. The charter revision is a function of city council. Uh, the members of the, uh, the mayor and the city council appoints the members and then we met. We met for over a year uh, to discuss all of these items. We had a public forum at city hall. Was the city, uh, does the city of Harper residents are aware of what you guys are trying to do? We've been meeting for over a year. Have you sent you know, literature to the voters, yes. to the electoral Yes, we had, because, we had. No, because you know what? None of my family, none of the people in Hartford, I already discussed, nobody knows what's going on. Okay, I'm just telling you how long we've been meeting. Yeah, but I'm telling you okay. that nobody knows, and they're really upset. I'm, I am helping the community. And you know what? You should not be taking away our vote and have somebody, some political game. The residents will decide that on the council. ballot, on the question. That's no, one of no. the questions. The problem is that you're not going to do this in a general election, which is going to be for the president that everyone goes out. This is a general election. Mind, this is a general election. I do not mind if you do this in a general election where everyone goes to vote where the president is you know, okay. they all go out to I vote think, for the president. I think we. But when you do it for for another election, that is not fair, and it should be appealed. Okay. I'm telling you that if it's going to be done that way, I opposed to this. And you know what? I went to this city, uh, to the sixth district. They don't know what's going on. I asked them, "Did you get something in writing?" Nobody knows. This has not been published. And I'm upset about that because I'm also going to add to your comment. I am being supporting politics. I have nothing to do with them because they don't give me anything. I've been spending my money to support them. But I'm going to be honest with you, everyone is looking out for themselves. They are asking for increasing their salaries. They are asking for benefits. They are asking for, for this, this, and that. They really are not doing anything for the community. Can we please have the next person who wants to talk? And you know, I'm upset about this, and I think this should be, talk among yourselves, and should be when we're voting for the president. All right. I'm James from Steady, as most of you people know. I live in the south end of Hartford. And I thank you very much for all you've done, Kenny, Ken, Kenny, to lead the commission. Okay? This was well publicized, well publicized for a long, long time. Okay? I remember when the stewards, and I was part of it way back when, because we're lifetime Hartford residents, we had signatures. Done. Do you want the charter revised? Yeah. Then we had to go back to the people. Do you want it revised again? So either you said yes or you said no. And it was 
revised. That's how we got the mayor to be the head. Do you have a of question? Everything. No, the question is, um, I thank you people. That's my question. This gentleman, I just want to ask him a question. Do you know how hard it is to be a Board of Education member in the city of Hartford? Do you know how hard it is? I'm sure it is because it, I know a town council people put in in my town. I'm what what town are you from, sir? Glastonbury. I'm the president of Glastonbury. my condo association. Which okay, is, that's uh, very good. And I know our board of education members work harder than our town oh, council that's members. Good. So I, I and have you, anything. Okay, very so, good. Okay, thank you. Very Next good. question. Come, come, come forward so that we can hear you. That's the main thing. We want to be able to hear you. Good evening. Good evening, Joe. I'm Sherman Bowens, and I'm a little confused. He brought, up one, he brought up one of my questions. We don't know what the mayor makes exactly. We don't know exactly. The community doesn't know exactly what what's going on here. And I'm a, I'm a person to bring it back to them through the NRZs you know, of Hartford. And also, we need to. I need to get this straight. Ethic Commission. But you said you you go to 129 towns, and one one person to runs can run the voters register. Is that right? No. What I said is, Connecticut has 169 towns. Okay. All of them have at least two registrars. Okay. But they size the job to the job to be done. So, so some of the register some towns the registrar works one day a month. Okay. Sometimes they work about half time, which is the case of my town. We mentioned towns, but not city. We oh, are, same, same thing. We are a city. They're called municipalities officially. They're okay. all 169 municipalities. That's good. From Hartford to Goshen to smaller places out there. So when you got a big town like Hartford, you can have two full time registrars maybe, but there's no reason you can't have three two thirds time or two. Or three full time and less deputies and assistants. That's all I'm saying. I, I want to understand. I'm glad what you, well, I understand what you're saying. The ethic commission, the mayor points of one, right? Is this right? According to one appointed by the mayor, one by the treasurer. And who's the, yeah, who's the third one? And uh, the, the other three would be the council would get the majority. The, so the council would point three. So we have. This, these are appointed by 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 the three we just mentioned, and that's and who they get a salary, correct? No, no, no. no. no salary. It's a value. Okay, I wish you would put that, and then I wouldn't be concerned about that. Right. <laughs> Sherman, Sherman, I would just like to add that if you're on the ethics commission, you cannot make political donations to any candidate running for office. You have to be independent of politics to be on the ethics commission. Anybody you could not have held a political office for three years. You could not have served in a uh, um, local office for three years. So it, there's, some off, there's a lot of restrictions on, on the membership of the, of the Ethics Commission. Okay, now the registration of, um, office, that's, that's a big one. That's a big one. Why, which, why are we making changes and what changes are we making? All right. L let me try this again. Uh, we've said it three or four times here tonight. One and, more time. And, and I'll say it one more time, in English. if I can. In English now. <laughs> Just put it out there. Keep it real in English. That's all I have to say. I can ask you to do the same. I'll the, uh, okay. I'll so let me just say very clearly, they are not eliminating the Registrar of Voters Office. Period. Clearly, without any question, they're not doing that. You're in violation of your charter. Right now the charter says you should have two. All the commission did was say, it shall have such registrars of voters. That could be three, it could be four, whatever state statutes permit, you can have. The current charter, and I wanna point this out as clearly as I can, and unequivocally as I can, currently has a provision that says if the state legislature changes the law, Hartford may consider to have an appointed registrar. That's not anything that's gonna be decided in November. That's in the charter. That was adopted by the voters of the city in 2002. So all this talk up here about, about change is not correct. 
You have a guy from Glastonbury saying, vote against it. They're not changing it. In fact, the argument is precisely in his favor. What you'll be voting against, if you vote against the issue on registered voters, if you just read the language, is you'll be voting against a provision that says a registered vote, voters is responsible for creating and maintaining the official registry list for the municipality, maintaining and preparing the voting machines, hiring and appointing poll workers, training poll workers, ensure, ensuring proper setup of the polling place, ensuring proper reporting of candidate totals on election night, and conducting post-election recounts and audits. That is real controversial. Why would anyone oppose that? I, I, you know, okay. I, as a rule, that's all I I'm get, saying. I get your answer. Yeah. Matt Ritter, let me say this, underline this. I asked Matt about this. Matt Ritter said, if the voters of Hartford decide what you'd like them to decide, we lose our right to vote for registrar, don't we? There were no more votes for registrar voters. That's not, not true. true. That's not true? Not Read true. it. What does it say? Read it. Not true. Yes, he did. Read the language. I, I had a long yeah. conversation with a couple of people. I'm sorry, I brought this up. No, 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 no. no, no. But that's it's, 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 it's three questions, and we're trying to clarify it. One, 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 one of the things is this. See what he said. The register of voters is a state position. It's, it's directed it by state law. Right. So yeah, if, if, state if law. the state, yeah. any member of the state general assembly, state rep or state senator, yeah. wants to put in a bill to change the state law, they can do that. City council can't put in a bill to change state law. I was, I was a state rep. So this is the confusion. The confusion is that we're saying that there should be some professionalism to the office. There should be responsibilities that's clear that the registered voters should have, regardless of how many you have. Then we're suggesting that the state law allows, it, if, it, if the state law does not allow it to be appointed right now. So you have to change the state law. State representatives, state senators can do that anytime if they want to. They don't have to wait for a city or a town to say, we want to change and we want to have an appointed rest of voters. A town cannot do that. Can't do it. A state representative, so I'm a little surprised that a state rep can, a state rep can, can change, can at least begin the process of changing the law. It's a state law. And that's why I try to educate people about state, local, and federal decision making. Because that's a state representative, state senator decision making. It's not a city council decision. We're just clarifying if the state law were to change, here's what we would suggest you do. That's what we're, we're suggesting. Exactly what I was a state representative. I took private funds Tell and public small. funds. I do take offense where I don't care who donated to my campaign. I represented the interests of the people who vote for me. And I've always done that. And one of the things is that unfortunately, just like you see with the state, of, with the Board of Education election, currently happen. We don't have enough political discussion with folks that are interested in the city, the day-to-day -day grind of the interests of the people to run. And I don't care who donates to me. I am responsible for the voters and that's what I would always do. And so uh, I, would hope, I would hope that our candidates and that the people, I'm disappointed that we have less than 50% of Harvard registered. Let, this gentleman first, yeah. and then you. Let, let, let me finish for a minute. Matt let, Ritter let, told let, me. If the state we law only have ten minutes left. Matt so Ritter told me that if the voters approve this, he'll bring it up to make a change of state law. Period. And it does say right here. I don't know why that's different from this. You read it. It says, "Charter authorizing council appointment of one or more registrars." That's it, right? Is that wrong? No, but right. there's an information well, that's sheet that's being here. handed out. All right, well, let's we have, get this to vote on. Okay, let's Bogus. have two, two more questions, and then I think we'll be about Bogus. done. Yes. So just to clarify, it sounds like this issue about appointment is kind of a non-starter because it's already in there. This is just reaffirming. That's Right, that's exactly Language right. that's already in there. Yeah. The, only difference, the only difference is it does take the next step and says that if you choose to go the appointment route, but that's only after the General Assembly changes right. the law. Right. All right? Right. If you choose to go that way, the council is the appointing authority. That is a legitimate point of debate. Right. The council would be the appointing authority. Yeah. 
All the other nice language aside, that is the point of debate whether you want to do that. Right now, you can move in this direction if the legislature moves in this direction. Right. Yeah. Because it says it, it right. repeats the provisions of the 2002 Correct. charter, which authorized council appointment. No, no. Well, that's I didn't uh, I didn't write that language. Oh. That was not as precise as it could have been. Okay. Which authorized the the, sh the shift if the legislature makes the shift. It, it's you know the general assembly would have to act first. If Hartford really right. wanted to go in this direction. If the voters of Hartford, if the mayor of Hartford and the legislative delegation went to, Har went to the General Assembly and said, we want to change this law, number one, you're going to have to get through 100, 168 communities and a registrar voters or, or association, which is a very, very strong association. The likelihood of you getting there is very, very limited. Right. Um, but this does not change anything. So we passed this and we could still have three people. Yeah. Well, we're, right now, you're in violation of your charter because the charter says you can only have two, even though state law overrides it. The, the main reason I had actually recommended that to them had nothing to do with politics. It had to do with the fact that state law permits this and why I have a charter that's at variance with state law. And that's so this why. This aligns it so that what we're currently doing actually is allowable. Be, correct. Right now you're in violation of your charter, but of course state law supersedes your charter. Right. Yeah. So. Okay. My, my um, other question or point, I, I think that um, the concerns around the three are important. Unfortunately, I think Hartford has a strange situation where our third registrar uh, is really, really hardworking, and I think yeah. we're moving her. I'm, I'm biased. I know her personally, but she puts her butt on the line every day to do this work, and I think that um, while it may not always be the case, we have a very special situation, and her being in there really promotes accountability um, when it comes to this. I think also I do understand um, Mike's concerns about um, it happening now. It's unfortunate. It kind of undermines the, um, the civic participation, the, the whole legitimacy of it, because with such low turnout around such huge issues, that is kind of a concern. And I think it speaks to the fact that we as a city have to figure out how to better involve our citizens in the process and not sit back and say, oh, why aren't people coming out or why don't they know about this? This stuff is complicated and right here in a room full of experts, most of us in this audience right now are struggling to understand this. So I think we really have to look hard at how we engage people and how we better engage our citizens so that we're not arguing about if this is happening in 2013 versus 14 versus 2020. So. Thank you. Dr. Painter, you have the last question. I have really two questions. First, Ken, um, Representative Green. Uh, there apparently was some reason why the salary issues for the mayor was brought up to move him from being uh, attached to the salary of the superior court judge or, or an appellate judge. Do you know why that was? Yes. Uh, they, we wanted to have a salary for the treasurer, and we wanted to come with a baseline figure for the treasurer. And so we were thinking about having the treasurer be on the same as the mayor, and that's how we came up with the two difference that the appellate court judge, the superior court judge, there's a slight difference, and that's how we could distinguish the mayor and the treasurer. So, so which gets the most salary? The mayor. The mayor. The mayor gets the appellate gets, court judge gets paid more than the, than the superior court judge. Okay, and you. so that's how we came up with the figure. Second question is uh, although I agree with Ken that in the state and in the national elections, the donors elect the candidates, I, I'm sort of like with Ken on the local election, it's hard for me to imagine that if $15,000 is the right amount for a candidate for council to have to spend, that that amount of money is going to subject the council person to any kind of pressure from a donor. I was on the council for seven years, and I never saw that kind of pressure at any time I was in the council. So I'm wondering, I would love to have a, a stronger rules at the state and national levels. I just don't see the point in uh, local elections, so perhaps you could explain that. Uh, I have two thoughts on that, and I'll make them quick. Number one is I, I feel like I'm the chief elected official, that there is a lot of pressure. Uh, in New Haven, the experience has been there's no publicly financed board of aldermen in New Haven. That tenant doesn't exist. Uh, but what we've seen is an explosion of funding because you have various, uh, so for example, in New Haven, you have Unite Here and Connecticut Citizens for a New Economy working very hard to spend a lot of money in aldermanic races. Uh, and 
you have a ward of 4,000 people in New Haven and they're spending $30,000 per ward. And that's kind of excessive. And, and public campaign financing can rein in spending because what you do is you have candidates voluntarily accepting limits. So the Supreme Court is, is debating right now whether or not to throw limits out the door, meaning that one person could donate $3.5 million to a federal candidate for Congress. If they throw limits out on the federal level, you can bet that limits are gonna be thrown out on the local level. Public campaign financing allows us to set voluntary limits because a candidate will sign a contract with the, the public campaign financing agency to say, I will not take a donation from anyone other than a human being, not a person as a corporation can be considered, or a union, or a political action committee. And the donation that I accept from a human being will be less than $370. Right now, that's the ceiling in New Haven. So you have a candidate running um, in New Haven for mayor who's voluntarily accepting contributions at a ceiling of $370 versus the state maximum of 1,000. And what that does is, if you wanna compete, it forces you to get more donors. So he's raised $100,000 and he's got three times as many donors as the person who's raised $100,000 on $1,000 donations. So the aim here is by voluntarily setting a limit, you're forcing the candidate to go out and talk to more voters and talk to more people and you're getting the candidate to pound the pavement more and ask more people for support. The, the, the idea is, is, I think the quid pro quo and the pay to play politics exists more where you have centralized power. The idea of public campaign financing and setting limits, preventing people from going to just a few people and forcing candidates to go out there to get more, works more on the legislative branch which is what my argument would be. Like right now, if you run for council, I know, Dr. Painter, you're an exception to the rule when you ran for, Cong or when you ran for city council. You already had a broad base of people. You weren't getting donations of $1,000 or you weren't taking PAC donations of $5,000 and that being your entire treasury. Whereas if we can get these limits and say, get candidates to say, I voluntarily swear off this money. I'm not gonna touch a union PAC dollar. That means you're not gonna have candidates on city council who are beholden to Ask Me or Hamia or Chapia or whatever alphabet soup unions are out there trying to influence the political and legislative process in the Court of Common Council. That, to me, is what clean election dollars mean. And that, to me, is why I think it's important for the legislative branch in the city of Hartford to begin saying, okay, we're only taking money from human beings and not people who are or unions or not persons who are, so th that would be my explanation. Yeah. I have to answer that because we're in vast disagreement here. This has got to be the real lab, quick. Real quick. I don't trust any bureaucracy at all, especially City Hall, be looking over my shoulder or anybody else's shoulder. We know from the state level what happened with the public financing. People ran with no chance to lose at all. Mike, and they were so given money. No minutes. They had no chance to lose, they got money. We had guys run with no chance to win that had a lot of fun with the money. Now, that's okay, that's the law. However, if they were to take money from a bureaucrat, they gotta have a bureaucrat running everything, he I'm should a have bureaucrat. a secretary. I am no. Mike's definition of a bureaucrat. In Hartford. Don't worry about it. In Hartford. But I just want to be clear, this is what his I'm dispute saying. is with. In Hartford. A person like can, myself can who finish? runs this. We'd have to have an executive director, of course. How are you gonna run such a thing without an executive director? And they'd have to have a secretary, probably an assistant, and of course an office, and a computer, and paperwork. We'd have to have a whole new bureaucracy to do what Ken wants. We'd have the bureaucracy Can to I know that in New Haven I do not have an office? Time? Yeah, give the audience time. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. No, because we're out of time. It's very important. Well, everybody's comment is important. In this is important. Please, thank you. No, can we can we just close we, this on a positive no, note? Thank you. you. No, and this is about him. No, he, when you said about the voters, you're on my list. Okay. You, I would love to volunteer okay. for you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. What does that mean? I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. This is democracy at its best. The debate is good. Thank all of you. Let's thank for our moderators, our others. Thank you.
Ross did a great job.